We go back to the one of Bukhari and the Prophet said, When I reached Qarn al-Manazil, i.e. at this stage now, فَرَفَعْتُ رَأْسِي I saw something in the heavens, I looked up. فَإِذَا أَنَا بِسَحَابَةٍ قَدْ أَظَلَّتْنِي There was a cloud that had given me shelter. And in this cloud, there was Jibreel. And Jibreel said to me that, Ya Muhammad وسلم, Your Lord has heard what your people have said to you and their rejection of you. He has sent me with the Malak or the angel of the mountains to put at your disposal and to do with as you please. Then he heard another voice and he said, I am the Malakul Jibal. And the Malakul Jibal, Sallama alayhi. He said salam to him. And then he said, Ya Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Say what you want. I am at your disposal. In shi'ta and utabbiq alayhim al akhshabain. Ta'if is between two large mountains. If you want, I can squeeze the city in between the two mountains. The Prophet Sallallahu said, No. Well, no, don't do this. Rather, I hope that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will extract from their progeny from their children, those who will eventually worship him without associating partners with him. The miracle, brothers and sisters, is not that Allah sent the angel down to be at his service. The miracle is not that the angel says, I can crush the two mountains. No, Allah, this is not the miracle. The real miracle is that the Prophet ﷺ, after such a rejection, and after this bleeding, and after this physical and emotional trauma and stress, still has the mercy in his heart to say, Bal, no, don't do that. If this this is not rahmatan lil alameen, then what is rahmatan lil alameen? And he makes dua that one day this city will be a Muslim city. And indeed, our Prophet himself was the one who barely 10 years after this incident reconquered Ta'if and many of the people at that city alive at the time eventually converted to Islam. If he had willed, there would be no city. But subhanAllah, instead of that, and I have been to Ta'if myself, the very place where the Prophet ﷺ was stoned, that very place has been made into a masjid where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is worshipped. On the way back to Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ camped outside of Mecca and as was his habit, he stood up to pray tahajjud. And he began reading his Quran in tahajjud. What happened is what Allah mentions in Surah Al-Ahqaf. When we cause a group of jinn to come pass by you and they started listening to the Quran. When they were in your presence and they heard this Quran, they all said, quiet, listen. If the world of men had rejected him, the world of jinn says, quiet, listen. If the world of the people of Ta'if had mocked him, the world of the jinn stopped dead on its track. Once you finished your tahajjud, so they listened to the whole tahajjud of the Prophet ﷺ. It was a real tahajjud, two, three hours long, minimum. And when they finished, they They were transformed not just into Muslims, they became warners and scholars and da'is to their own people. And they returned all the way back to their people. And they said, They said, O our people, we have heard of a book that has come after the book of Musa. And it is calling people to righteousness and guidance. O our people, respond to the caller of Allah and believe in him and this was the first batch of jinn converts to Islam and these very people they went to their people and their people converted to Islam and they came back to Mecca while the Prophet was in Mecca and they wanted to learn Islam from him Ibn Mas'ud was asked by his student al was anybody there when the Prophet experienced the Laylat al-Jinn it is called the Laylat al-Jinn there's two reports the first one is in Sahih Muslim and it goes as follows Ibn Mas'ud said no nobody was there. One night we were with the Prophet وسلم, and then he disappeared. And we started looking for him everywhere. And we could not find him. And we thought that he had been kidnapped or assassinated. And we spent the worst night of our lives until when the morning broke, we saw him coming from the direction of Ghari Hira. So they said, Ya Rasulullah, where were you? We missed you. We couldn't find you. And so the Prophet said, Da'ani atani da'in min al-jinn. That one of the callers of the 
jinn came to me, telling me there's a congregation waiting for you. So I went out to meet with them and I recited Quran to them. He said, do you want to come with me to see the remnants? They said, of course. So Ibn Mas'ud said, he walked with us and he showed us their campsite. He showed us the fires that they had lit. So he showed us the after effects of that, even though of course the Sahaba were right there, they didn't see it because this is the world of the jinn. This is the version of Sahih Muslim. There's another version in Mustadrak al-Hakim and that is that the Prophet once while he was in Mecca, he said, whoever wants to come with me to be with the matter of the jinn, Amr al-Jinn can come with me. So Ibn Mas'ud said, I was the only one who went. And we started walking until we came to a valley outside of Mecca and he drew a line in the sand, the Prophet him, and he said, sit here and do not move from this spot until I come back. So the Prophet ﷺ continued walking and he recited Quran and black clouds started appearing around him until he disappeared into those black clouds until I could hear him but I could not see him. And there was a, a whirling of clouds around him until it just disappeared in front of my eyes. And one group of these clouds remained in the distance but the Prophet ﷺ was gone, I couldn't see him. So basically the group split up, some remained and some took the Prophet ﷺ somewhere. And I waited until Fajr and then I saw the Prophet ﷺ come back and when he came back he said, where is the other group of jinn? So Ibn Mas'ud pointed to the clouds in the and he said, it's over there. So the Prophet ﷺ gave them some bones and some animal dung. And he told them that these bones would be food for them and the animal dung would be food for their animals. And therefore this shows us, by the way, that even the jinns have animals. So there's something called animal jinns as well. Now, this portion of the hadith is mentioned in Bukhari and Muslim and in many different portions. And that is that the Prophet ﷺ said that the jinn basically asked him, where will we get our food from? So the Prophet ﷺ said, every bit of bone that my ummah eats and mentions Allah's name over, every bone shall become flesh for you. So whatever meat that we eat, while we say Bismillah, or we sacrifice an animal, we say Bismillah, we eat the meat, but then there is another type of meat in another world beyond our senses where the Muslim jinns can eat of this meat. The reason why the jinns are asking this is because the shayateen eat that over which Allah's name has not been mentioned. And so the shayateen eat haram meat basically. So the Muslim jinn said, now that we've accepted Islam, where will our food come from? So the Prophet ﷺ gave them the counter that from now on, any Muslim who eats anything, that food will become food for you. And the animal droppings of the animals that the Muslims have, they will become, they will be transformed into the food for your animals. How did the Prophet ﷺ re-enter Mecca? We already said that by turning his back and walking out, he's basically cutting off officially by walking out of Mecca and disappearing for 10 days, khalas, the fate is sealed now. This is basically exit no, no re-entry. His adopted son, Zayd, asked him, Ya Rasulullah, how are we going to enter Mecca now that you have been expelled from it? He said, Ya Zayd, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make a way out for us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help his prophet and make his message supreme. And the Prophet ﷺ then began sending emissaries to two or three allies within Quraysh that he thought might be sympathetic to his call. The first of these was Al-Akhnas ibn Shuraiq and Al-Akhnas ibn Shuraiq sent a message back saying that I'm not in a position to give you protection. So he sends it to Suhail ibn Amr. Suhail ibn Amr sends back that I am Banu Amr, uh, Amr ibn Lu'ay and Banu Amr ibn Lu'ay have never given protection for somebody from the Banu Ka'ab. I, I don't want to start a precedent. And then he sends it to the third one and that is Mut'im ibn Adi. Mut'im ibn Adi is the chieftain of the Banu Nawfal ibn Abdi Mana. So Mut'im ibn Adi, he is sent a message. The Prophet is saying that will you give me your ajid, your protection? And so Mut'im doesn't just send a messenger back. Mut'im tells his sons, he has four sons, go arm yourselves, put your armor on, get your weapons and go and follow the messenger back and come as armed guards, guards guarding the Prophet Sallallahu and bring him straight back to me. And Mut'im went to the Kaaba to receive him. And he said to the Prophet do tawaf, I'm waiting for you. So the Prophet did tawaf, got armed. The guard is doing tawaf with him to guard him, right? And then when he finishes, everybody's wondering what is going on here. Mut'im stands up and he says, O people of Mecca, I have given my protection to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Abu Sufyan stood up and said, are you his follower or are you just giving a protection? So he said, no, I'm not a follower. I'm just giving protection. Abu Sufyan said, in that case, we shall accept it. And so the Prophet ﷺ remained under the protection of Mut'im for another year and a half, less than two years. And he remained in the protection of Mut'im and he kept on figuring out another way, another way, another way until finally Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened for him the door of Medina 